how this body has been able to come together, and um, I know that, um, that all the different entities and agencies are working hard, and there's been money allocated or money uh, sought after, and there's been uh, a lot of uh, progress made. So, Ryan. Yeah, thank you, uh, Director Gilarducci. Again, <clears throat> my name's Ryan Arba. I am the branch chief for the Earthquake and Tsunami Program. Uh, so, yes, since the last time we uh, uh, met, a lot of progress has been made. Um, <clears throat> of the, uh, in the federal, or excuse me, in the fiscal year, 1617 funding, we received 10 million of that. That's all uh, we've been contracted and continuing to progress on work. Uh, most notably, the, uh, we allocated about six and a half million for station installations. Um, so we're continuing the earthquake early warning system build out. Um, uh, much progress has been made on scouting and identifying and working through the different steps prior to installing the stations. At this point, we've installed about 40 of the 183 stations, so much work remains to be done, but uh, as, as mentioned, the, the steps prior to that are now for the most part done. So what we'll see over the next year now is some very aggressive uh, station uh, installation timelines So uh, in order to get to the point where we have installed the 183 um, that we committed to uh, with the 1617 funds. Uh, in addition, we have a little less than two and a half million educated for a, or excuse me, allocated for a media campaign to accompany, um, uh, to accompany our earthquake early warning, not only our system build out, but also these initial stages of the system rolled out uh, when we're starting to interface what the earthquake early warning system will look like to the public. Um, so Joe Barry is here through the California Broadcasters Association, been working very closely with him um, on developing what that initial uh, campaign could look like. And we're looking at um, incorporating some of the recommendations that you'll see coming from the business plan in terms of the timeline and matching that up with their initial stages of, of what's come to be known as the limited rollout for the system. Um, so uh, in addition, you've also, uh, Emily um, is here. Uh, Tina Walker accepted a promotion um, to another uh, division. So Emily Holland is now acting uh, as um, our earthquake uh, early warning executive officer to the board. Um, yeah. So uh, a few weeks ago, we hosted a, uh, we're, what we're calling a West Coast Symposium. So our partners in Oregon and Washington uh, had wanted uh, help in reaching out to the emergency management community in their states. And in addition, we wanted to also use that as an opportunity to socialize earthquake early warning uh, within our stakeholders and such. So we went to CSTI, which is the California Specialized Training Institute, and hosted a one-day symposium where we learned about, uh, about the specifics with earthquake early warning, and we heard from a few of the pilot programs, too. Um, so a few of these pilot programs, one uh, Universal City, for example, has several different applications going right now for earthquake early warning. Um, the city of Los Angeles has some plans on what they're looking to do in earthquake early warning coming up on the next six months to a year, as well as uh, the city of San Francisco also talked about some of the concepts that they're working through. So these created some very good use cases that as we're rolling out over the next six months to a year, we can tap into those cases to build further successes. In addition, another uh, concept that came from the business plan, which you'll hear later, is uh, the need for a memorandum of understanding uh, with the USGS. And that's something that we're in the initial stages of working through right now. So again, a, an opportunity for us to define roles and responsibilities and make sure, making sure that we're meeting um, the timelines that are being demanded on us by the public um, in order to move forward on this system. Uh, the stage one of rollout, is, as it's being called, uh, is uh, something that uh, we're looking at for this year. Um, so, uh, however, the final parameters of what that will look like um, it may include just an institutional touch. Uh, it may include some level of a public touch and such. And I'm hoping that as we uh, meet today and we go through the different components of the business plan, you can think through the different uh, sections of uh, society that you represent and how, uh, and if, see if you have any input and think, help us think through how we might frame that to those segments. Um, and in addition, we have one project that we're funding, and again, working with Oregon and Washington and the USGS on, uh, to uh, create recommendations for a specific tone and alert message um, and branding style for what earthquake early warning could look like 
um, when, as we're starting to look toward that public touch. Um, so, uh, yeah. Can you also talk about um, engagement with CTIA and some of the work that you've been doing? Yeah, there? certainly. So, um, uh, so a few years ago, the um, Alliance for Telecom Industry Solutions, which is a, uh, um, a group which represents some of the telecom firms as well as the handset developers, so such as uh, uh, Nokia, um, Samsung, et cetera, took a really critical look at what earthquake early warning, um, what the, the requirements were, and then what the um, system could handle. Uh, and we may have gone over this a little bit in the past, but in essence, their initial study uh, was that using wireless emergency alerts um, could be, would, would be too slow. Um, so the latencies we were looking at were 30 plus seconds uh, from the time the earthquake early warning alert or the, um, the shake alert gets delivered to the handsets and then for it to be distributed. Uh, recently, uh, the parts of this group have gone back and taken a really hard look and they've found that in some cases, it may actually only be milliseconds to deliver that alert. Um, so we have this opportunity now um, where um, as, as we hear feedback, we have some press opportunities and, and such uh, where everybody's asking, not only when am I gonna get the earthquake early warning signal, but when is it coming to my phone? Um, so there may be a chance for um, certain parts within the system to be able to get an earthquake early warning alert over wireless emergency alerts. Um, so it's something that we're, we're st tracking very closely and, and looking, at those, um, looking at those different system components to, to see how fast that can move. So uh, I just want to say that you know um, after the fires, uh, there's been a lot of a lot of attention given to uh, alert and warning, and um, you know both at the well, at every level of government, and and a lot of meetings that we've had with the uh, private sector, not just here at the state, but but uh, nationally, you know the FCC um, and FEMA and DHS. Um, all working on trying to improve the quality and the um, and the assurance, the reliability uh, of these systems. I mean, one uh, and and all of this does. You know, when you, you talk about alert and warnings that we that we will utilize during the fires is is one thing, but it's many of the same systems that would be utilized technically um, for earthquake early warning. And there were cases where um, some of that infrastructure failed. Um, and so we're looking and talking a lot about reliability and sustainability and hardening and how we can ensure that there's redundancies uh, in place. I don't think that for earthquake early warning, really, there's a there's a silver bullet or a single pathway, but a series of redundant pathways that I think that we're going to be, well, that I know that we're looking at, uh, including, you know, microwave and wireless and satellite and et cetera. Uh, but importantly, um, you know, there's been a, a, some pieces of legislation that have been introduced, mm -hmm. which which uh, will have a tangential impact on the uh, alert and warning in California. One is, for example, that uh, many of the uh, systems that that individuals utilize uh, or counties use that individuals could utilize have typically been um, opt-in systems. Uh, the legislation that's underway will make all of those an opt-out system. In other words, everybody would get the alert unless they physically opt out, which is a better way to be and, and it ensures that more people are getting it. And it does speak to why cell phones will be an important component to the earthquake early warning uh, solution um, uh, because of, of that, you know, the many of those systems would be utilized. Um, I think we're also looking at, um, uh, through legislation, standardized templating uh, across all 58 counties. Uh, which, which would conceivably include earthquake early warning uh, uh, messaging that, that can be um, identified through that legislation. Um, so, you know, there's the whole basis of, of alert and warning is, is more uh, focused today, which is really a good thing. Um, and, um, and I think that um, this whole piece you know, and everybody truly understands that the, the earthquake early warning is, and I, I was really happy to hear this in, in many of the hearings that I've been in since the fires, uh, that um, I get questions regularly about the fact that, hey, earthquake early warning isn't mutually exclusive 
from all the other warnings that we're doing. And, and, and really it needs to be all as part of that rubric of alert and warning. And I think that's really important because, you know, it, it, it focuses all the, the efforts that are being, being made under that, um, under that uh, uh, effort. And uh, <coughs> probably one of the most significant things that could happen in California, obviously, is, is getting this, this system in place. So um, appreciate the updates and all the continual work that's, that's being done. And looking at the sensor board, the, uh, <coughs> the addition of sensors represent on that board uh, the newer ones uh, represented in the in with the different colors. What could you describe that? Yeah, um, in the upper left hand corner, you're looking at what was existing uh, prior to the 1617 budget being passed. In the lower left hand corner, you're seeing we're adding a color, which I'm kind of seeing out of the corner of my eye, blue, I think, um, uh, which is the ones that we're working on installing right now. Um, those are being installed through contracts with the California Geologic Survey, UC Berkeley, USGS, and Caltech. Um, the future one would be based on uh, our budget proposal that we have going through um, the process right now, uh, which would be for an additional 15 million, and that would complete the seismic instrument build out. Yeah. So I, I just want to say, I mean, that's very, I mean, you guys are doing a great job, and it's moving, given the fact that, um, you know, there's still existing um, environmental uh, considerations and yeah. permitting and all these things that, that were having to deal with, albeit they've been accelerated to the greatest extent possible. Um, I continue to work on the issue of CEQA and um, um, to try to address that, uh, to streamline that effort. Um, uh, can't do much about NEPA. Um, and, um, and we have been very successful in working with all the state agencies and local governments to ensure that um, sites could be utilized there. And um, we're, we're finalizing um, agreements uh, to ensure that, that there's no fees uh, that are charged. Um, that, that's happened in a few cases, and, and we're working through those, uh, that if they're going to be using state property for this uh, endeavor, that there would be no, there'd be no cost to it. So um, all these are little cascading pieces and parts that are required to build out this, this system throughout the massive nation state of California, right? Um, so, nice job. Thank you. So we'll have uh, Matt and Katrina from Blue Sky. They're they're coming up next to present uh, on provide an update on the business plan, and we'll have time for a nice full in depth discussion. But I thought uh, prior to bringing Matt and Katrina up here, I, I would try to frame up ways that as advisory board members you could help us at this point. Um, so, so thinking through the business plan as you're hearing it, think about the challenge that lie ahead with implementing the business plan. Um, we'll have a rough structure on this first rollout. Um, think through how that might impact uh, the different sectors that you represent. Um, and then also within those sectors, what's the best way to socialize this plan? Um, and finally, I thought it might be worth, uh, since uh, Matt and Katrina have done a very comprehensive part of capturing the risks, uh, think through the different sectors and how those risks uh, weigh out within your communities. Um, and with that, I'll invite uh, Matt and Katrina to come up and present. Hello. Oh. Uh, it's good to see everybody again. Thank you very much for your patience as the advisory board meeting was rescheduled a few times. Um, in the interim, uh, there has been some really great discussions that um, have advanced the telemetry planning, telemetry being the transmission of the data from the sensors to the central processing sites um, that have resulted in a, a better telemetry plan that's more cost effective that we've been able to include in this business plan. And we'll talk more about that as we, as we get underway. Um, since we've met with you last, we've revised some of the budget numbers that you've seen previously, and we'll talk about those differences. Um, as Ryan mentioned, there have been some additional uh, federal and state funds that we've been able to incorporate here, or potential state funds and, and federal funds. Um, so we are going to 
walk through to give you an overview of these budget numbers and uh, present to you, go over these key issues that Ryan um, alluded to having to do with the limited public rollout, key decisions that need to be made um, about the, the breadth of and scope of that rollout, um, risks and issues to consider there that Matt will go into detail about, um, as, as well as the thinking through the process by which those decisions need to be made in a collaborative sense between USGS and Cal OAS. And we look forward to a good discussion with you guys. As I mentioned, Cal OAS um, has, has been a, a great partner working through this business plan with us and um, working with USGS. And so this, what we're presenting to you today is really a collaborative effort among all of these parties. And uh, we think that it outlines the significant steps that will really get us from where we are to where we need to go to get this critical system up and running. And so to give you a bit of an overview, Ryan mentioned some of this, but the, um, much, much has been already done to bring the system online. As Ryan mentioned, the $6 million have gone towards building out those stations. Um, we anticipate an additional $15 million, at, at least there's the potential for the additional $15 million, and we've incorporated it in our budget at this point, assuming it's going forward. Um, and we can talk about how it would impact the budget should that not be the case. Um, there is a working version of, of the alert algorithm that is currently being piloted by some institutions. And as Brian went over the um, cell phone discussions, getting the technology um, up and going to alert individual cell phones, um, much still needs to be done uh, for outreach and education and, and before we get there. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about telemetry. Um, the, the main challenges that remain are completing this seismic build out, which is really important. And it's, it's not just financing it, as, as uh, Mr. Gilarducci mentioned, it's, it's also overcoming these permitting hurdles, um, which, can, which can add time and delay. And, and the more sensors you can get up, the more quickly, the more reliable the, the alerts are. <clears throat> the telemetry plan um, still needs to be refined. I'll pause here and give you a bit of a recap of, of where we were and kind of how we've come along. Um, so initially, USGS did a, a really great overview, a needs assessment of what, what do we need from our telemetry system in order to have sufficient diversity and redundancy such that it can be reliable during an earthquake. Um, that currently it's re too reliant on cell and internet technology, for example, which is vulnerable uh, to being taken out during an earthquake, for example. Um, it can add latency to the signal being delivered in certain geographical areas that um, do not have a, a microwave system in, the, in those areas. And so uh, the USGS initially um, did that assessment and developed a financing a budget for it that would um, minimize ongoing costs, but it involved more initial upfront costs. Um, and, it, and then uh, the, the Cal OES and USGS worked together to um, really take advantage of the state microwave system to the fullest extent possible. The state microwave system is, is excellent and has really fantastic reliability um, and, and is a great partner it, um, in this telemetry plan um, and and in so doing to make it cost effective um, the Cal OES has agreed to bring the price down um, it's a part of the ongoing price it's called the mileage rate so we've been able to incorporate that um, lower ongoing cost in order to make it a cost effective the most cost effective and reliable plan um, and uh, going forward, that plan still needs to be refined because it's a very preliminary plan that's conceptual at this stage. Uh, engineering hasn't taken place yet to really make sure that you have a line of sight from one location to another. Not all of the seismic station sites have been finalized. So um, there still is an aspect of 
uncertainty regarding those costs and those plans that need to continue to be fleshed out over time. Um, so I think that that gives you a sense of kind of where we've been. I mean, the telemetry planning just began in the fall, and, and they've been working very diligently at uh, negotiating this telemetry plan throughout uh, these past few months, and we'll continue to do so. But it's, it's on a really good track. Um, there, the additional things that are important to be done include uh, continued research and development to refine the computer al algorithm that sends out the, the alert. Um, the, for example, GPS data needs to be incorporated into that algorithm. Um, the, there, there needs to be more development of um, the what will go into the public campaign for the outreach campaign um, prior to the general public receiving the alert. And the financing plan will need to be implemented. There needs to be a stable ongoing source of funding. Uh, and the various organizations involved need to continue to strengthen the development of their memorandum of understanding and their decision-making processes to, to get together. Um, so the ad additional investments, there are approximately 282 seismic stations that need to be built. Uh, and if the 15 million approved by the state general fund uh, is approved, then it, that can cover those seismic stations. There need to be some upgrades to uh, almost 300 GPS stations. Um, and I've covered the telemetry uh, improvements that need to be made. The, oh, no, I guess I described the plan. But the telemetry improvements that that need to be made in addition to connecting to the state microwave system. There are some areas where neither the USGS system nor the state microwave system extend. And in those areas, we do need to fund um, some additional build out for some microwave towers in those areas not currently covered. Um, and then the, the outreach and education budget includes a, a fund, a, a one-time cost for a big push up front um, that will communicate to the public what is the alert, how to interpret that alert, and how to respond to the alert, to the alert given their particular circumstances. Um, so these are the additional one-time capital investments. And here is the, the budget that uh, we've worked hard with Cal OES and USGS to develop. Um, these these, uh, the budget for the seismic stations, um, we've included a, a long appendix in the report describing our methodologies for each of these items. Um, the seismic stations were developed, for example, um, we walked through kind of, we, we started with historical budgets with the USGS partners um, through this and current budgets through um, their implementation of building the seismic stations using the $6 million from, this, from the state recently. Um, they have a lot of very recent experience in building these stations, and we really walked through, we developed a framework and walked through with them, um, here, you know, what, is, what are the tasks that need to be done, um, how long does that, will that take you to do, and develop a per unit uh, cost that we then multiply by the number of seismic stations. Um, we did the same kind of thing for the GPS stations. Um, the, the telemetry plan has a lot of various components. It's pretty complicated, um, but as I mentioned, it involves some building out of stations where the state or microwave doesn't extend. It involves rebalancing the spatial coverage, so an important concept of, of a reliable telemetry system involves um, uh, diversity of modes, and so you need in each geographic region a balance of different types of telemetry, so cell um, and and microwave and fiber optic cable, and and there are already some pre-existing stations uh, with a certain mode, and so rebalancing the spatial coverage just means rebalancing the type of mode in that geographical area to accomplish the diversity needed. Um, so those are the types of costs uh, folded into the backbone telemetry. And then I've already mentioned the outreach and education, and that cost was based on um, looking at interviewing strategists who have been involved in public and private campaigns, mainly public campaigns, and, and taking some, some budgets that, with some successful um, outreach, like the H1N1 flu campaign in 2010, 2011, um, Flex Alert campaign, um, and some others to, to arrive at this, 
with this estimate. There's um, a contingency here because, as I mentioned, particularly with regard to the telemetry plan, it's still in the conceptual phase, and, and so we included some contingency funds here. Um, as that engineering takes place, the um, costs may be different from what we expect, the, the best that we can estimate at this point. Um, the potential state funds we've described, the um, federal government has uh, passed in their fiscal year 2018 budget $10 million for early warning, which can be split between the West Coast. And the USGS has 180 days to determine how to spend those funds. So at this point, we've included an estimate based on historical funding of what might be attributed to California. So that's this five and a half million that you see here. So ultimately, the, the total we estimate is 37 and a half million. Um, but with these other funds, we estimate the total cost to be around 16 million. Hey, Katrina, uh, what would uh -huh. be a good time to ask questions? Is it, you're going to pause at some point or? Interrupt me. Just as, is that okay? Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, on the backbone telemetry. Yes. So have we done a, um, like a feasibility study to make sure that it has the capability to handle ad additional use of earthquake early warning? This, as the state microwave system? Yeah. yeah. Yes, actually. They, um, you, at Cal OES has been piloting that. Um, does someone from Cal OES want to describe, give an update on that? Sure. So um, the, I, I believe the system today uses some level of microwave technology, and I'm looking at some of my partners here for a head nod in some form or another. Yes, excellent, okay. Um, so part of what we did with the 16, 17 monies, we set aside a small amount in order to do the what's considered the final drop off. So we have our state microwave backbone, um, which is consists of Cal OES's towers as well as other state government towers, which we have governance over. Um, we were sending, we set up a test for about a half dozen uh, seismic instrument stations to basically hop on to the microwave network, take one hop uh, over, so from one tower to another tower, and then go to uh, Caltech, where one of the servers is that processes the algorithm that eventually distributes you an early warning alert. Um, we've gotten that all the way to the, I think to that final point, um, but I, of course, can get back on the details, but we've, we've we're using the technology now. We have the specific pilot to, test the feasibility with the state microwave network, and once that's complete, then any seismic instrument that has line of sight to a tower feasibly could hop on and uh, be used. Yeah, and I think, um, Barry, um, the fact that this massive infrastructure is in place and gives us a springboard, you know, instead of having to recreate the wheel, that we're, we're just leveraging the existing, and it covers the whole state, you know, pretty, pretty um, equally. No, it's good. No, I, I like the idea. It's just, you know, I'd just say feasibility just around, you know, cybersecurity issues and you mentioned the coverage issues, but I, mean, I like the like the idea. Just curious on how how deep sure. uh, we've gone with uh, making sure it work. Yeah, and I think I think part of it is that there will always be a mix. It's never going to be one mode or the other. Um, in some, even if say a, an inst a seismic station is. Close to a tower, it's got to have the line of sight. So maybe in that case, it might use another form of telemetry. But. And I would just add, I, the you. OES people will, will correct me if I'm wrong here, but the, the state microwave network primarily is used for public safety communications. In fact, it's called public safety communications. So, so um, it is already very um, redundant in terms of it, the, the ways that data can go from one place to another. If there's a single tower or multiple towers that fail, the signal can still go through another path to get to where it needs to go. Um, and the amount of additional data that would be added by having earthquake early warning put in place in addition to what's already there is apparently a very, very small additional fraction. It's, you know, they estimate less than 1% increase in, in data traffic on the network. So there's no capacity issue in terms of the network's ability to handle that capacity. Um, so my understanding is that um, the results of the test that Ryan described, notwithstanding um, everyone's expectation, is that this is very feasible. Mm -hmm. Uh, Are there yeah. other questions okay. about the the one-time cost before we move on, or how the cost estimates were put together? Um, it, it turns out that um, for purposes of putting the business plan together, um, uh, we spent a lot of effort on really trying to 
pin down as accurately as we could what these costs were. There had been preliminary estimates that had been put in place before, um, but obviously if we're gonna go to the legislature and say we need some extra money, uh, it's important to know how much money do we need and in the event the legislature asks questions about why do you need this amount or how did you come up with these numbers, we certainly wanted to be able to provide them with an answer that they would have confidence in. So uh, as Katrina said, we work closely with the network partners and Cal OES to try to uh, put these together, um, but certainly welcome any questions you have uh, as an audience that's looking at this and might anticipate what the legislature would say. Yeah, I have a question here. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I can My wait. Yeah, um, the, it, it, it seems to vary quite a bit depending on the type of land that the station intends to be um, built on. Um, the, I, from, from what I understand from a few months ago, so this may be a bit outdated and Mr. Giladucci may have to um, correct me, but my understanding is, is that um, there needed to there needed to be um, Cal OES needed to sort out if there could be an expedited process for the CEQA permitting. Um, without that, it could be very expensive and take quite a lot of time in order to do a full environmental review um, for for each site, and and that um, an expedited process would allow you to consider the fact that these are very these have very small footprints, and um, that, and and but you still have to go through a public comment process, um, so that there's still going to be some type of delay of, of I believe 30 days to um, open any even an expedited site up for public process. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, uh, that it pretty much on my. Council's here, so and he's been working, and the team has been working on this issue. You know, there's a lot of different ways to address this challenge. One is through, you know, through the normal process and and talking with our experts in CEQA over at um, uh, OPR, Office of Planning and Research. Um, they, you know, 30 days is it, it can be even a little faster than that. It depends on the circumstances and the location. Uh, if there's any high sensitivities like historical, tribal, um, or you know, if you're putting it in the in the middle of a community where you know people generally are be looking at it and they need to get a sense of what it's doing, um, and so um, so the it, it can be um, uh, an expedited process, but it could be a non-expedited process could take a long time given those factors that I just spoke about. Um, to try to find ways to accelerate that further, we are exploring um, executive order uh, authority. We are exploring um, just a piece of legislation that would give us the ability that's actually written in legislation about being able to expedite this, you know, and, and um, circumventing the secret process. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of different areas that that um, that are factors in this and. Uh, in the interim, you know, the message has been to, to move forward irrespective of that. We'll continue to work through that. Um, not as simple as, as it is to say, you know, um, we'll waive CEQA. In the case of a, a disaster or emergency, we waive CEQA all the time, but it's in that context. And this is, this is sort of an infrastructure build out, so um, a little more difficult. Um, but it, but we, are, we are addressing it. So I had a question about the budget. And so it looks like 16.3 million come from general fund, assuming it gets approved this spring. 15.75. Um, plus the 5.5 5 from, oh, that's federal fund. OK. Yeah. Um, so where does the rest of the money come from? We'll get there. OK. No problem. It's an important question, <laughs> one hopefully that we cover sufficiently. Um, okay, so let me quickly go over the main ongoing costs that we've estimated. 
we, uh, we again took a similar approach as we did with the capital costs where we started with historical budgets and we really went through, itemized it line by line. Um, historical budgets weren't sufficient to project what we anticipate is needed in the future due to the fact that the funding currently has been flat funded and underfunded. It didn't take into account the fact that we need real time telemetry, those costs go up. Um, the, sorry, the, the last mile telemetry charges. Um, as, a, as opposed to the full telemetry system uh, the, that we've been talking about as the backbone telemetry. Um, the, the, the station maintenance costs also include equipment replacement costs, which historically have not been incorporated in the budgets. Uh, central site operations budgets also needed to be updated to account for more IT security, um, as well as additional personnel to monitor the data quality in real time. Um, then the, it includes the telemetry data transmission costs uh, in an ongoing basis. Outreach and education is a critical function here. Uh, in addition to Cal OAS staff that really need to be spearheading the California strategy and outreach materials, um, that, that they're working in collaboration with JCCO, which is the joint committee that focuses on communication, education, and outreach nationwide and tries to um, have a, a unified message nationwide and, and Cal OES is a part of that committee. Um, but Cal OES is in charge of the message for California. And so they need staff um, working diligently on that. Um, we anticipate a lot of technical user support being necessary, especially in, in the early stages of unrolling this plan, working with institutions, um, having maybe a regional hands-on team, a help desk, uh, what Cal OES determines as is necessary. And then there needs to be ongoing research and media campaigns. Uh, we, and we base these estimates on uh, existing campaigns such as Go Slow for the Cone Zone, things like that. Um, that that there, this is a new system. It's going to take time for the message to really saturate. So um, there needs to be an ongoing push for that. Uh, the, we anticipate also needing additional research and development or funding Cal OES staff to keep pushing um, on research and development. Cal OES staff have done a great job of developing ideas for a prototype for data casting, which offers an alternative way of receiving the signal. Um, the, currently, the signal is sent out over the internet, and the data casting offers an alt alternative way. And they've been um, thinking about how to develop a receiver that, that could even engage with, with machinery. So these, these kinds of alternatives are important. Um, to, to continue to think about how to deliver the signal to the users. Uh, and then it, it includes uh, program management. And uh, so here's the budget. This looks pretty different from what you saw last time. Um, the way we laid it out is different, for one. Um, the, the numbers at the top include the full estimate, and then we, we take into account existing funds at the bottom. And our previous slide incorporated existing funds. So these numbers look are very tough to compare to what we showed you last time. Um, they, they take into account the, the full uh, cost of the seismic stations and, and operating the central sites and the last mile telemetry. Much of that is covered by existing funding through um, CIS. CISN is the, the base network that, that are already exists and includes and, and is funded with federal funds and state funds. As I mentioned previously, there are some additional costs to having a real-time to, uh, to a real-time early warning system. Um, and so we so those costs don't fully cover anymore the total costs that we projected here, the, the 20 million. Um, these uh, in, in addition, we've incorporated GPS stations, which also have existing funds, um, and we've incorporated the backbone telemetry and ongoing funds here. And, and we've included some contingencies since, um, again, this system is new, and um, you know we've done our best effort to be most diligent to develop these cost estimates, but we've included a contingency um, given that uh, some things may happen that are unforeseeable. Um, so that uh, that is is this layout clear to everybody of, of what we've incorporated here? I kind of give you a, a snapshot of these ongoing costs and that we have existing funds. Um, of course, there's a lot of complexity behind these numbers uh, that we can come back to later if you'd like. But I, I'd like to give Matt a chance to move things along unless anyone has some questions at this point. 
Okay, well, thank you, Katrina. So um, now we get to the question of, of how do we pay for all of this? Um, and just to be clear here, there's there's two components to what we need to pay for. One is the, the one time or capital costs, and then the other is on an ongoing basis every year, what do we need? Um, I, in the these displays and in the business plan, what we've tried to show is what additional funding is needed after we take into account all the existing funding sources that we expect to continue, what additional funding is needed. So that's what this 16.4 million reflects is that's the amount of additional annual funding that we would need for California to come up with in order to uh, get earthquake early warning going and sustain it on an ongoing basis. Um, the report itself, which you, I think, have a copy of, um, has a lot of detail in the appendix about how these numbers were calculated. And um, again, if there's questions about that, we're happy to go over it. Um, but um, you know, I, I guess I hesitate to say what the most important elements here are. There's, there's building all the stations and getting the system itself up and running. Obviously, that's critically important. The business plan talks about those tasks. Um, but if we can't pay for it, then we don't have anything, right? And so, you know, the financing is also a very important component of, uh, of the business plan and of getting this system going. Um, so we tried to think about what are the characteristics that a, a financing plan or a financing strategy would have. Obviously, we need to come up with the money, $16.4 million a year. Um, we have to make sure that that amount of money would grow over time as costs increase with inflation. Um, because we don't want to be underfunded in five or ten years because we, we didn't think about uh, growth in the funding source. Um, ideally, there'd be some kind of a nexus between the people that are paying and the people that are benefiting from the system. Um, so that would be uh, important to have for the system. Um, we don't want to create a brand new revenue source that's very expensive to collect, where we end up taking a lot of the money that is collected and paying it to tax collectors. We would like to leverage an existing revenue source um, or develop one which is uh, inexpensive to collect. Um, and of course, it has to be dedicated to this purpose and is a stable funding source, so ideally not one which um, could easily be undone or unraveled or used for a different purpose, but something that would be uh, dedicated to earthquake early warning. Um, so, there we go. Um, so here are some of the financing options that we considered. Um, I think we went over these when we met with you all last fall, and uh, I think one of the questions that was asked was, uh, what are the pros and cons of these various financing options? And so we've added a discussion in the report and this table, which kind of lays out, um, you know, what are the what are the highlights as far as why you might prefer one financing option or another. Um, I don't think we necessarily need to go uh, through all of these, but you know, some of the things that um, could certainly work would be um, you could charge electricity utility users with a little extra charge on a utility bill, for example. Um, same thing could happen with natural gas. Uh, tr regulated transportation providers could also be, uh, if the legislature gave authority to the CPUC, then they could pass this charge. They could have utility or uh, transportation providers collect this extra revenue, and that could be a funding source. We talked about a cell phone charge last time. That's still an option that could work. Um, so these are the kinds of things that are considered. The business plan uh, no longer makes a specific recommendation about which of these would work the best. Um, that's in order to give OES the flexibility that it'll need to try to negotiate with stakeholders and the legislature over what kind of a financing strategy might make most sense. Um, and so I think uh, any of the four that I just mentioned or some combination thereof and probably others could work. Um, and so uh, that's kind of to, to, you know, to the future for, for all of you and OES to work out with the legislature and the administration about how uh, these could be put together to come up with the money that's needed. Have you um, done any type of calculation of what that charge would look like for, say, an electric utility user or a cell phone connection charge, like what that cost to the consumer would be? Yeah, we have done that, um, and we sort of have that information at the ready. Again, because we haven't uh, recommended a specific um, revenue source, that information is not presented here. But we're talking about $16 million in a state of almost 40 million people. So you know, you can imagine the charge per person is less than 50 cents per year, um, whether it's on a utility bill or on a cell phone bill. Um, so a, a relatively minor charge, you know, pe pennies per month per person. Um, so uh, in a big state like California, I think any of these charges would be, um, it wouldn't have a tremendous impact on 
uh, individual people's lives or it wouldn't radically change behavior where people would say, well, I'm going to use less of this and more of that because things have changed. They're, they're pretty small amounts. And that's even more true if it's a little charge on a cell phone bill and a little charge on electricity, you know, then it's even less on each of those bills individually. Um, so, but we do have those calculations and, and we're sort of, uh, I think, prepared to answer questions from the legislature about those things if we need to. But again, because the amounts are relatively modest, um, I think the impact will be relatively modest as well. Um, are there other questions about the specific financing sources that are on this table or other things that relate to that? Okay. Um, uh, just to kind of um, summarize here, um, we've tried to um, put together a, a strategy for financing the one-time and capital costs and the ongoing costs. Um, so um, as we showed in the capital cost display, around $16 million is still needed. Uh, the, everything is around $16 million, which makes it kind of confusing here, but there's about $16 million in capital costs that's needed. That assumes that this 15.75, which rounds to 16 million from the let, from the general fund is approved. So the governor proposed in his 18-19 budget to provide 15.75 million for earthquake early warning, which is enough to complete the build out of the remaining seismic stations. So we're assuming that the legislature will approve the proposal in the governor's budget um, and that's what's incorporated into the financing plan. Obviously, if that doesn't happen, things would change. But again, at this point, our assumption is that that is approved. So after the, the uh, assuming the state general fund money is approved, we still need about $16 million in one-time costs. Um, now, to pay for these, we had earlier talked about um, the possibility of a revenue bond or some other kind of financing mechanism to pay for these one-time costs. But um, since the fall, what's happened is um, the estimated telemetry costs have come down by quite a bit. The proposal from the governor for $16 million in one-time funding uh, has been made, and the federal government approved $10 million in ongoing or in, in one-time funds for earthquake early warning. All of those things dramatically lowered the, re the remaining outstanding one-time costs that are needed, such that now we only need about $16 million. Um, and I just don't think we would need, um, nor would it be practical, to issue a bond for a relatively small amount like that. So um, how we could pay for it um, would be basically out of ongoing funds. If the legislature approves an ongoing revenue source or a combination of revenue sources that generates the 16.3 million a year, or 4 million a year that we need, um, not all of that money is needed immediately in the first year. For example, that 16 million includes maintenance costs for 1,115 seismic stations. But we don't have 1,115 seismic stations currently built, so the ones that aren't built don't need to be maintained next year, say. So if the legislature approves funding, we can use some of that maintenance money and apply it towards one-time costs. The same thing is true for outreach and education costs. We haven't launched the system yet, but the funding to provide ongoing outreach and education costs would be included in the 16 million. We could use a portion of that money to pay for the one-time cost. So basically, um, what this shows is that over the next three or four years, we could use the ongoing revenues to pay down the one-time costs. Um, and then as the system gets built up, the cost would increase, but our need for those one-time costs would have been paid off. And then what we'll be left with is just the ongoing costs and a sufficient revenue source to pay for them. Uh, so again, we think that we could kind of pay as you go without having to um, borrow the money or issue a bond. So are there questions about uh, how we would pay these uh, one-time costs down using the ongoing revenue source? So, okay, so my question is, um, this would impact the schedule then if it, you're sort of spreading those costs across four years, would that like delay the rollout of the system? We don't think so because um, as we've been talking about the, the schedule, for example, for um, it, building the seismic stations envisions that it doesn't all happen all at once. We have to identify where those stations will go and um, the seismologists have an idea of where they want to put the stations, but um, sometimes the site they've selected isn't feasible because there's a CEQA problem or the landowner says, no, I don't want a station here, whatever. So those stations might have to get moved to another place. So there's 
um, there's a need to identify where the final sites will be, and then you have to get permits, and then you have to build them, and so that takes some time. And so um, we think that the kind of schedule of building those stations, for example, would allow for, for uh, building them as quickly as possible, um, but we wouldn't have to maintain them uh, until a few years after they're built, and so the revenue would still be there. So the, the short answer is no, we don't think that this methodology or proposed approach would delay things. And but, I would add, as you can see from, from the numbers, we anticipate that um, you, you, could, you could gear a lot of the um, ongoing funds in the first year, a good chunk of that, to building out the capital costs. And so the pace, you know, it's not a full four years. It's, um, it, uh, you'll, you would have the bulk of the ongoing costs that, that you need, you know, um, pretty soon. Assuming the legislature is cooperative and approves the financing source, which is uh, or sources, which is what all of this depends on. But just yeah. to clarify, there the feds have already approved their budget. Yeah, so the, the federal mm -hmm. budget that was just approved uh, in March um, includes um, continued ongoing funding for the USGS for earthquake early warning, and actually an increase of a couple million dollars in the ongoing funding for earthquake early warning, and ten million dollars of one-time funding. Um, for earthquake early warning. Um, and as Katrina said, a portion of that would come to California and a portion would go to the other states that are part of the network. But that is already appropriated money, which the people at the USGS are busy figuring out exactly how they'll spend. But um, that is money that's, that's already there. Mm -hmm. I guess, Matt, under the <clears throat> current governance structure that I guess it would be Cal OES that would be responsible to kind of carry out this maintenance inspection of sensors? Has that been worked out? Or? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, the, there, there isn't really, uh, the, the governance structure is not finalized, and one of the recommendations we have in here is to continue to work on that so it's finalized. Um, the, the pattern so far has been that the stations have been funded by federal sources or state sources uh, via contract between OES, <clears throat> excuse me, and the entity that's responsible for building and operating the station. And so each of the entities, like UC Berkeley, for example, which got some funding to build a station, is also doing the maintenance for that um, uh, under uh, a contract with OES. Ryan, okay. did you want to add yeah, anything and, to that? And I can add also, er, we had earlier legislation, and the number's not coming to me, that established an earthquake safety fund. So that has the ability to capture um, whatever, this, uh, whatever this source would be um, and then it would come through Cal OES, and we would be operating through a similar format that we have today with our um, short-time money, either you know through contracts and interagency agreements and, and such. But let me just say that, um, so the California Integrated Seismic Network, which is the consortium of, um, of um, organizations that basically do Earthquake Early One in California, will continue to have that responsibility for the most part. However, as we grow um, and expand and incorporate uh, partners uh, ac across the board, that may change or expand, or if it brings value or um, there's a need, you know, um, for an organization, like for example, you know, your organization has got a series of sensors and, you know, to incorporate that data analytics and, and make that a part of the system would be somewhere where there could be some joint efforts there. So um, that's part we still haven't worked through all of that, but generally the CISN partners are the the primary entity that will will keep that that program going. And uh, maybe you were asking a slightly broader question. I'm not sure, and this is covered a little later in the presentation, but it, it's relevant now, I guess. Is that um, if the legislature is going to appropriate 16 million dollars a year for this purpose, then um, I imagine that they will want to make sure that the money is spent properly and there's some accountability so that when, when the state spends money, it, it gets what it thinks it's getting. Um, and I think it would then be up to OES to, to make sure that the parties with whom they contract are living up to their obligations and that the money it spends itself is spent wisely. So I, I think that is the role for OES is to be the, the steward of those funds and be sure they're spent wisely. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. So Barry, what happens is if, if, we, if we're collecting a fee whatever, there's an, uh, the, the legislature gives us authority to collect that amount, and then we bring that in, and then we push it out to pay for the bills. There has to be a audit trail and a re requirement to make sure that that's all done appropriately and uh, 
uh, you know, and then, then the books get balanced at the end of the fiscal year. Okay, are there other questions about how we would uh, pay for this? All right, I'll let you ask another one later even though we're moving on, so don't worry. Um, and there we go. Um, so just um, kind of moving on to the next piece, which is so important here, which is the kind of management of the program and, and how we make sure that it, that it happens, assuming we've got the funding for it. Um, you know, I think we've largely covered this. Um, the state has done a lot in the last few years um, to really move earthquake early warning along, including assuming the legislature approves it this year, more than $25 million in, in one-time funding um, and ongoing funding for uh, OES to, to implement the system. Um, so there's a lot that's been happening, which, which Ryan has already covered and Katrina's talked about a little bit. Um, so as far as what remains um, to be done, um, There we go. Um, I think the, the most important piece, um, uh, other than the financing which remains, is really to work out this, this kind of governance that we've been talking about. Um, this is a system which um, has been developed in partnership. The USGS has, has been building it with the university partners. Um, OES is the state agency tasked with responsibility for implementing earthquake early warning in California. And so, um, kind of getting these parties to work together or figuring out the best way for the parties to work together is kind of the, the remaining challenge. And as Ryan said, there's a memorandum of understanding which the parties, the USGS and Cal OES have been uh, negotiating, um, but really figuring out who's doing what, how a decision is made in the event that there is not an agreement about what should be done, uh, and making sure that there's open lines of communication or that those lines of communication continue to be open, uh, I think is really the fundamental management challenge of this program. Um, and I think there's been real uh, evidence that, that that process of communication can be very effective. Katrina um, talked about something which has probably been behind the scenes for all of you, but was really fundamental to this plan, which was the de development of a telemetry plan. It's a big component of the capital cost and obviously getting the data from the sensors to the computers so the alert can go out is a fundamental component of the program. Um, and, and what happened was the parties came together. Um, this is really one of the reasons why uh, there was a delay in presenting this work to all of you is that um, OES really wanted to make sure that that telemetry plan um, leveraged the existing state network to the maximum extent possible. And that meant getting the people from the, who run that network here, talking with the USGS people to try to work out that uh, telemetry plan. And I think a lot of progress was made. I think the um, resulting plan is better than the kind of earlier incarnations, which were a little bit developed more separately. Um, and so there's a real, um, uh, that's a real example of how effective communication has happened. And if we can continue that, um, I think that'll be important um, to, to moving things along uh, in the future. Um, so, um, our recommendations as far as program management are concerned are that they should be an MOU of some kind that's um, signed between the two parties. Um, it should be in place prior to appropriating any funds under a fee or a tax that the legislature might approve so that there's this accountability that we've talked about where everyone knows kind of what's expected of them and, and you know what the money is for. Um, that requires that the tasks be divided up. Who's gonna do what? Um, you know, we haven't really taken a, a specific role on that. That's up to the USGS and OES to negotiate. But, um, you know, one logical division of labor um, would be for the USGS to continue to manage the scientific aspects of the system, um, collecting the data, developing the algorithm, um, uh, you know, figuring out what should trigger an alert. Um, OES, I think, has a lot of expertise in um, communicating with the public around emergencies and disasters and leveraging that expertise um, with OES taking responsibility for kind of uh, distributing the signal to people, making sure that people know what to do when they get the signal, making sure that people do get the signal in terms of they, they know they have access to it. There's been outreach to, to businesses and individuals ultimately um, to, so that people know uh, to use the signal um, would be a, a good role for OES. Um, 
Are there questions about this issue of the MOU or the division of roles and responsibilities? I just might, may add that the, the MOU um, actually is, it's in the process. So, you know, we have it, USGS now has it, and um, working through the finer de details of that, I, I suspect we should see something within the next few weeks on that. So I'll address that issue. Is it, hey, Mark, is it consistent with that division? Oh, I think it is, right? It's pretty much consistent with the division of, of, uh, of labor. Speaks to the fact that the CISN is, uh, is the, the body in the, in the state that's been doing that and the role of USGS generally um, consistent with, uh, I don't know if it actually spells that exactly like that, but it's consistent with what is up on the board. Yeah, and there's there's also a part in the business plan too, which goes through different roles and responsibilities. So it's um, so you can see, uh, yes, that's that's the one logical um, division. I think that's our our basis. But there's some level of overlap. So part of this uh, MOU that we're currently working on is really getting into the details on on that overlap, and also starting to use that as a jumping place to plan for these next stages as we're going forward. Thank you. No, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it looks very tidy here. There's two bullets. There's two organization. Each each side does one thing. But in reality, there's a lot of things that don't sort of fit neatly into that. And I think that's the, the nuance that's being worked out now. Um, I have to aim this way. Um, of course, in addition to OES and USGS, there is lots of other entities uh, involved in making earthquake early warning a success. Um, we talked a little bit about the role that the cell phone providers will play in making sure people get the signal. Uh, transportation providers um, might be asked to pay some of the costs uh, and also to be users of the system. BART already is a user um, on a pilot basis, but there's um, other trains and other transit providers that could really benefit from the system. School districts are another place where um, the system could really be used. Um, there's probably a role for third-party vendors who will provide the kind of bridge between the signal and how to use the signal. So if a office building wants to have its elevators automatically stopped, they may not know how to do that on their own. It's likely that a, that a third party would be hired to help them with the using of the signal or the automation. The business plan doesn't presume that that's a role for OES or the government to play, but rather that um, private companies on their own would have to um, you know, with help and with the right information, uh, but with their own resources, figure out how to use the signal. Let, let me quickly point out that, um, that, that USGS has supported the development of this, um, of, of private entities developing the, the capacity to do so and the expertise to do so. They've been, been granting limited access through research and development uh, uh, parameters um, to allow companies to begin to develop this expertise to fulfill this role once the signal is made um, accessible more widely. And then lastly, um, there's local offices of emergency management, management, one of whom is represented here, um, who will obviously also have a role to play in helping their communities um, you know, make use of and respond appropriately to the signal. Um, and so that's another important entity or, or type of entity that um, has a role to play in earthquake early warning. Um, the next thing which is shown here is a kind of a, a rough timeline of um, how things could progress uh, if, uh, if the funding is provided and if things continue to move uh, uh, forward as they have in the past. There's a much more detailed timeline presented in the report, so this is just a, a quick summary of um, what would happen, but it imagines um, a, a first stage rollout or a limited public rollout occurring this year, um, and then uh, continued development of the um, infrastructure that's needed to um, install the rest of the stations, uh, and then um, final full public access um, by 2021. Um, and again, there's a, there's a lot more detail in the report on these things. Um, the next topic, um, which we talked a little bit about before uh, in the fall, um, is the kind of what this first stage rollout or what the limited public rollout would look like. Um, the um, 
you know, this is an important opportunity. It's even though there are some pilot users now, um, this is really the first chance the public would have to become aware of the system. Uh, I hope and expect there would be a lot of press around this. I assume Mark will talk to the media, maybe the governor and other elected officials will. Um, and so it's a real opportunity to increase awareness of the system. Um, and so I think, therefore, it's an important opportunity to, to plan for and, and make, take advantage of. Um, I think everybody thinks that some kind of uh, first stage rollout or limited public rollout or whatever the term is should happen in 2018. Um, but again, as we talked about last time, there is a little bit of um, discussion still happening over what the contours of that uh, rollout would look like. Um, OK. Um, so um, you know, the question is, how, how fast do we move? How, how, how many users and which kind of users should have access right away? Um, and uh, I don't want to rehash the discussion we had in the fall. Um, the issues are still really the same ones. Um, you know, the faster we move, the quicker we're able to give the public the public safety benefits of using the signal. Uh, on the other hand, um, moving more quickly carries with it some risks. Um, people may not know how to respond to the signal. Um, there could be false or missed alerts, um, which would cause people to lose faith uh, or confidence in the system. And so those things need to be carefully balanced. But um, I think we had a pretty good discussion about this last time. And uh, my recollection is that the consensus of, of this group was uh, moving quickly made sense as long as there weren't undue risks to having people be misled, but that in general, as long as users were informed that the system was still in development, uh, that they could then make their own decision, each user, about is the risk worth it to me? If I have very high costs of a false alert, uh, I might wait until I think there's more certainty about what the system can do. But if I'm someone with a lower cost of a false alert, say a school district, uh, I can just treat a false alert like a drill. And oh, we thought there might be shaking. There wasn't, but we've practiced and we know what to do next time. And so that's an example of an entity that would have a low cost of a, of a false alert. Um, and so uh, given that, as long as users are informed that there's these possibilities of um, the signal not being perfect in its, uh, in its early incarnation, um, we think it makes sense to um, move as quickly as we can. I think that covers. So just a quick question on that. You yeah. had mentioned you had been working with some of the technology companies involved and in being able to deliver the signal faster. Um, is there any sense that in addition to it being faster, it could be more reliable as well? Or is that are those two totally separate yeah. technologies? I mean, when I, when I tend to think about reliability in terms of the system, I think about the, um, the instruments and their ability to pick up the earthquake. Um, when it comes to distributing the message, uh, that's that's where speed is the the main focus. So yes, every 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 different opportunity from using say like uh, a, something similar to a NOAA weather radio, relying on like an FM radio signal or somewhere on that spectrum, latencies are introduced. Satellite technology, there's latencies, and based on uh, California and our system, really anything beyond uh, I would, you know, just to pick a number, ten seconds or so. Um, might produce enough of a, a gap between where the earthquake starts and where the heavy shaking is that it, it wouldn't be potentially worthwhile. Now, there's, there are many cases where beyond that it could still be worthwhile, but that's, uh, that's where, um, you know, especially looking at like Mexico City's system, for example, they can use some of those other technologies because they're dependent on a fault line that's offshore, so you have a 200 mile distance to travel. So you can have latencies of 30 seconds per se and still be able to provide the benefit to Mexico City. Um, towards California, we don't have that luxury in many cases. And just to clarify, I think um, uh, there's uh, there's different kinds of users. The first group of users that I think most people are imagining would have access to the signal would be institutional users. So where, where you can train your own employees or you can work with school children to say, this is what we do in the event of an earthquake. Um, with the alert to the general public probably coming a little bit later, um, for two reasons. One, the cell phone technology is not quite ready yet, as we've discussed. And two, we haven't done the outreach and education that would be needed to let people know what to do when this alert shows up on their phone. Um, and so I think uh, in terms of phasing the rollout, everyone I think thinks that makes sense um, with the, the rollout to the general public 
probably happening um, down the road. Um, but again, what the contours of this are um, is, is up to the OES and, and USGS and the other parties to work out, and that's something which has not finally happened yet. There's still discussions going on about what exactly should happen this year uh, and what the schedule would be for, for subsequent phases of the rollout. So again, the reason for our suggestion that um, continued discussions and, a, and an MOU that everyone understands for how to make those decisions is developed. And a further, further clarification, um, I, I, this concept of reliability um, really comes from how many stations are built out. The more stations you have, the more reliable that, that the stations can determine if it's an earthquake by triangulating from multiple stations. Um, so the, what Matt was talking about, that, um, an institutional user could decide if, if the risk of employing, making use of this signal at this point in time um, is worth it to them or not. Uh, there, there could be a cost to a false alert for them once the stations are further built out and the Telemetry um, is more robust than at a you know down the road that that metric for reliability is improved and more institutional users may find it in their interest to make use of the signal. But in terms of this earlier limited rollout phase, um, an institutional user may decide they'd like to wait until the system is more reliable or perhaps um, the risk for uh, the cost for a false alert are low and they'd rather go ahead and make use of it. So, so that's a good point. I think is one of the challenges that you know are in front of us. I um, I will tell you that um, you know we we believe that there's going to and and I'm going to encourage some early adopters uh, that that will work with us on the private side. You know, industry that would want to utilize um, this. I think that the, you know one could argue Bart's already using it. It's it's already in place there. They they have. You know, they understand the false positives that could, uh, or the anomalies that could be in the system. And I think that's a good example to demonstrate um, that, um, you know, even without the official rollout, um, there are, there are uh, industries that are using it to the reliability that it is bringing to the table. It will only get better. Um, so early adopters are going to be important. Um, uh, and I do think that, you know, there's... That this whole issue of, of, uh, of um, quantifying limited rollout um, in 2018 will be important um, because we, I definitely want something out in 2018. So that, that's something that we're pushing hard on um, uh, to the best degree possible. And um, uh, But again, it, all the things that, um, that have been mentioned here are, are challenges. And so the, the staff and partner agencies and, and all of us have been working hard to try to, to quantify that, um, get the rest, you know, as many of these built out as possible. Um, and, um, uh, and I think we're ha we have places where we have saturation of sensors, like in the LA basin and the Bay Area where we, we, we could do something on a limited basis at this point. So we'll see how that goes. That's, that's in, the, in the coming months to to finalize all that. We'll keep you all up to speed on that. Thank you for clarifying. That was going to be my question when you talk about the limited rollout. Where do you go first? And then as you look at the build out, how do you select where you're going to be going? Um, because if you look at you know San Francisco and LA with a concentration of the existing, um, I'm sure that they welcome the opportunity, but those areas that don't have it right now, the question will be, when, when do we get it? Well, I mean, I, th I, th I think that's, you know, like any of these events, there's a high degree of interest and in alert and warning across the land today, more than ever before. And um, recently there was a quake in, I think, the Channel Islands or... Santa Barbara area that generated, you know, there was a test of the system uh, apparently and generated a lot of interest. People want to know. I, I think, you know, real, realistically, you know, from, from our standpoint, um, it'll probably be focused. And again, this, the team will be working on this. So don't take what I'm to say as possible, but I would, I would suspect that it's going to be 
initially in the high density areas, high population zones um, that have a lot of sensors already built out in it that we can have some level of reliability that we know that is going to work in those. And then, and then they're going to have to figure out, you know, where the, where the next rollouts are going to be. But I, I think it would be really important in our journey on that pathway to develop a timeline that we share where the, this will progressively, you know, evolve and, get communities around that so that they are also working at it and looking forward to it and, you know, um, and industries uh, around it. Because, um, you know, what, what, once it starts to work a few times uh, in, in the pilot areas uh, and we really promote that, you'll, you'll see a true great interest of people wanting to, to get it. Well, and I would guess, I mean, I am not the scientist here, but that we've picked these spots because that's where the faults are and where the greatest risk greatest risk is um, versus maybe some of the other regions. For, for placement of the sensor stations? Yeah, um, yeah they, they certainly are located where the faults are, and, and that brings up an important point. When you look at the map, the sensors, um, where, where there's a lack of sensors, if the earthquake initiates there, that's you know th that's where sensors wouldn't pick up on if if they're there and so as you're thinking about geography, um, it's not just a matter of of setting it up such that users w are using the signal where the stations are. The the signal could actually still be useful to individuals in other geographies even if the earthquake originates where there are sensors. If the earthquake originates in San Francisco, it could still be useful to um, locations outside of San Francisco that don't have sensors because what matters is where the earthquake originates. Does, it, does that make sense? I went ahead and, yeah. and grabbed Doug. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got a few of them here today, so they can talk. So, so, um, I, so I think the question, just to recap, was about uh, where are the sensors today? and based on the known faults and such, but I think it's also looking toward how is the build-out being determined um, and for the future. Is that a good way? Yeah. Okay. Just go ahead and introduce you. Yeah, I'm Doug Given. I'm the Earthquake Early Warning Coordinator for the U.S. Geological Survey, and I'm a geophysicist, um, and one of the scientists in the room. Uh, got some other folks here, too. Uh, Peggy Helwig from UC Berkeley, and Dave Croker, USGS in Menlo Park. Um, I'll try to keep it really brief. Um, originally, when we looked at how many stations it would take to cover uh, the West Coast and California, uh, there was a study done to look at what is the optimal station density for earthquake early warning. There's a point of diminishing return. You know, you could blanket uh, the state with sensors every 50 meters, and that wouldn't help. So the optimal spacing is approximately 20 kilometers, actually a little bit less. Um, but what we decided to do in terms of design was a density of 10 kilometers in the highest population areas uh, where there was also significant seismic risk. Um, and part of the reason for that over-densification is that you can lose some stations and still not lose the speed that is reflected in that 20-kilometer uh, optimal density. 20 kilometers in areas of known sources and around the population centers and out where there's basically very little population and very few faults, more like 40 kilometers. And you can see that the station density diminishes as you go eastward away from the San Andreas system and the coastline. So that's the, the bottom line there. Now, we're only about 50% built out. Uh, according to those numbers, the magic number in California is 1,115. And when we did uh, get some funding to build out the network, we prioritized the highest risk, highest population areas, and that's why we are well clustered in Los Angeles and the Bay. So that's the story as it stands today. Um, we think we have uh, close to target density in those population areas. Uh, we need additional building out to cover some other areas. Um, and another thing to keep in mind, though, there's a subtlety here, is that even in some of these areas where you see uh, dots that are contributing, some of those still need additional upgrade to speed them up. So it's a little bit of a complicated picture. Uh, but we're making good progress. And of course, as more funding comes in, we'll complete the build out. So just for reference, the density of stations in the Bay Area and in the greater LA area were already this high before 
the build out started, they just weren't delivering data fast enough. They were this high because this is the place where you want to measure the ground movement in a big earthquake so you can do evaluations for structural purposes. And part of the early part of the build out was the improvement of those stations with fast telemetry and faster telemetry so that we actually get the data in time to do alerts. So in essence, Peg, in essence, Peggy, what you're saying is that some of them were repurposed and upgraded. No, they, they were multi-purposed and upgraded. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. They're still good enough for the engineering purposes. Maybe even better. Including some of John's stations. <laughs> yes, right. You're at the Cal uh, Geologic Survey has how many stations, John? How many stations does, does Cal Geologic Survey have? Okay, and then we're converting. I think about uh, 105 is ultimately will be dual purpose into this network. So when they say dual purpose, you're talking about strong motion sensing and earthquake early warning. And earthquake early warning with full time communication, real time communication. Yeah. So a lot happening in that area. Right. So just to be clear, I mean, this was uh, the early warning capability was, was built on top of the existing mm -hmm. seismic networks, the CISN. Um, so we leveraged all of that. Uh, and that's one thing to keep in mind uh, with the budget numbers. The, the budget assumes that the existing seismic networks are fully funded at their current levels. Um, and the additional incremental costs are on top of that already base cost for operating the networks that existed before the project started. Um, yeah, and, and just to be clear and to whine a little bit, we have been flat funded for many, many years after going downhill. Yeah. <laughs> that's not scientific, that's just budget, so thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, so I think that covers uh, sort of where we are and what our suggestion is for the limited public rollout. Um, the next piece is the risk assessment. Um, this is largely unchanged from what you guys saw back in the fall. Clearly with any big project like this, there are risks, and what we tried to do is go through those risks, which are um, in the business plan report um, and in the hard copy of the presentation that you guys have, and try to figure out um, at least some ideas of how we might mitigate those risks. Oh. Um, so I don't know that we need to go through uh, each of these, um, but I think, uh, as Ryan suggested, one of the roles that you all could play that would be helpful would be to think about um, how do these risks interface with your organizations or the stakeholders that you have relationships with or represent um, so that uh, to the extent one of these risks does emerge, um, you're able to help try to, try to mitigate it. Um, so there's two pages of that. Uh, the last thing is um, the suggestion was made at the last um, meeting of this group that we tried to the extent we could to talk about what are the benefits of earthquake early warning in a, in a quantified way um, to compare to the costs. Um, and I think that's an important suggestion any time we're asking the taxpayers in California or the legislature to pay for something, we probably need to let them know that they're going to get their money's worth or that it's a good idea. Um, a full cost benefit analysis was really beyond the scope of our business plan here, um, but really I don't think necessary because the costs of the system are so small compared to the potential benefits um, that they're, they're really overwhelmed by those benefits. Um, uh, there was a report that the OES um, commissioned a couple years ago um, from the Pacific Earthquake and Engineering Center uh, at UC Berkeley, um, and they uh, did a lot of uh, outreach to potential users of this system to figure out if industry really thought there were benefits here, and the, the overwhelming response uh, to that uh, assessment was yes. Um, uh, and then um, there was also a study done by um, Richard Allen, who heads the seismology lab at Berkeley, and his colleague. Um, and what they found was they, they just took some examples. What, what is sort of the scope of the benefits that, uh, that exist here for earthquake early warning? So one of the examples is, um, uh, you know, if there were, if there were funding um, and there was earthquake early warning in place, they estimate that 
um, two to three billion in injury-related costs um, stemming from the Northridge quake, had it been in place at that time, um, could have been reduced um, by about half in a similar quake. So um, there were an enormous amount of costs from that earthquake came from people's injuries, the things falling on people. Um, and so if you know a warning went off right now and we all had time to get under these not very big desks, um, there would be a real chance of avoiding injury and those injuries end up being quite costly. So they, they estimated that about half of the injury costs from a major earthquake uh, could go away with successful earthquake early warning. So, Obviously, that's a big number. If we, if we saved a billion dollars in costs, even if it's only a once every 30 year or less off an earthquake, um, we're talking about $16 million a year to fund a system like this. So it would take a long time uh, for, the, for the cost to outweigh the benefits of a system like this. Um, another example they offered was uh, how expensive a BART train is. BART's been in the process uh, thankfully to someone who rides BART occasionally, of upgrading their cars. Um, the new cars are about $30 million. Um, and so you wouldn't have to save very many BART cars from derailing um, before you had paid for the whole cost of the system statewide. Obviously, those benefits would accrue to any rail system anywhere in the state. If you could prevent a derailment or injuries on a train, um, you could save a lot of money that way. Um, so I think the point is that um, the potential benefits, and these are just some anecdotes, um, vastly outweigh the cost of the system. And so uh, we have a little section in the report which covers this and hopefully makes the case to uh, the legislature and people who would be asked to pay for it, that it's really an investment that's worthwhile. Yeah, Matt, just a comment to that and, and for, for consideration, I really think a benefit that we don't think about are aftershocks. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, first responders out there, and, you know, so we think of earthquake early warning for the initial earthquake, but it's got huge, huge benefits for those that are in the field, restoring service and, and helping injured people and so forth. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And in fact, one of the reasons why um, the uh, upgraded telemetry system is so important is for exactly that reason, that you might have a system that if it relies on the cell phone network, like the system primarily does now, that works for the first earthquake. But if it goes down because the cell network is, is down after the earthquake and there's an aftershock an hour later, the, and then you don't have telemetry, then you can't get the benefit of earthquake early warning for the aftershock. So that's why a robust telemetry system is so important. Um, so I think you're right that the aftershocks are, are not to be ignored in our thinking about all of this. Um, so um, just to summarize, um, our recommendations for the business plan are um, that Cal OES and USGS should finalize their MOU and make sure that they've clearly delineated roles and responsibilities and some mechanism for making decisions about how uh, we move forward from here. Um, that you have a limited public rollout or first stage rollout um, that occurs this year um, to the widest possible group. Um, uh, that can be informed of what the risks are of the system and its limitations, but that the widest possible group be given access to the system uh, as soon as possible. Um, and then to the legislature to approve a funding source or sources to pay for this program on an ongoing basis. Um, so that's it for the business plan. Um, are there questions about this last bit with the recommendations or any of the other elements? Um, Mark, did you want to add anything? Well, if there's... Okay. So the Blue Sky team have become experts uh, on earthquake <laughs> early warning. I, you know, you guys have done, really learned a great deal and have done a great job. So really appreciate you, all the work that you guys put into this report and I know we were we put some heavy duty um, uh, requirements and and expectations, and you really rose to the occasions and and really tracking down it all. So, thank you very much for all of your efforts, and uh, it's a it's a very important document that's really going to help us uh, a great deal and help the state of California a great deal. So, very much appreciate that. Well, thank you. It's, this is obviously very important work, and you, you guys are all doing it. We're just kind of. Uh, trying to push it along a little bit, but mostly I think your team and the USGS and university partners are doing great work and I really hope that the system is up and running soon and we all get to benefit from it. Uh, is there any public comment? Seeing none, um, if there are any other closing comments by any members of the advisory board? 
I also would like to echo the words and say thank you very much. This was a very thorough report, and I appreciate the time and thought process that went into it and really spelling out the various recommendations and really making it a, um, a good case for it. Um, so I appreciate the work that went into this. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add the same as Mark says. This is a lot of moving parts, and you've really simplified it to a way that's really understandable and I think actionable, so thank you. There might be a few people out here thinking we oversimplified it. I hope not too much, but we did, we did realize that the legislature was the audience for this, so a little simplification was needed. I have a, a high-level um, question, um, and this goes to um, eventually, ideally, we would be able to leverage the existing alerting and warning systems that are installed across the state or in every municipality has one, every university has one. And I'm curious as to, um, I mean, these are all third-party vendor-based systems pretty much. I'm, I'm curious as to the feasibility or um, what, what discussions have um, occurred to kind of move in that direction in terms of actually disseminating, you know, the, the warning as part of all the other alerts and warnings that we currently um, disseminate. You know, just one, one thing to start off that conversation. Uh, most of, to my knowledge, a lot of those vendors rely on what's called CAP messages, Common Alerting Protocol messages. And I think some of the work that uh, Doug and his team at USGS are doing right now uh, with FEMA um, is uh, testing how we can take the shake alert signal into a CAP message to be distributed. Um, so that's part of the equation. I think, the, there's, I think there are higher end users that might want more uh, flexibility on, say, setting threshold levels or you know other uh, determinations, and that's where the private sector really has to come in and um, and learn about what the signal is and in order to redistribute it in that way. But two two basic concepts. I think I think though, very well said, but it's a very complicated topic um, because there's a lot of. There's a lot of junk out there. There's a lot of different stuff out there. This is what we're finding uh, with the whole alert and warning. One of the things that we're working on now is to make sta standards and guidelines for appropriate um, alert and warning messaging and um, how that's going to, to operate. Some of the systems that are currently being used will, will fall off because they're just not going to be able to, to meet the requirements. Um, but. Um, uh, it, it is it is a it is something that we need to look through. The the other piece is there's going to be a lot of third party vendors that develop products that can go into your home, can go into whatever your school, can be the one things that make the fire doors go up, firehouse doors go up. We we need to be careful as we move forward with that, um, and not not sort of diminish innovation, but um, make sure that there's you know people buy something and it's not reliable and we're sending the signal out and they don't get it. We may want to look at, you know, key standards for what's going to go into schools or public facilities or something like that. Certainly private organizations, if they're going to put their manufacturing lines or their, their, their um, power distribution systems or whatever on this, um, they need to have, know that whatever they're putting there has got to be solid. So I, I think it, that'll shake out in time, but it's a, it's a complicated one. Okay, so let me just say, uh, again, thank you to, to all of you. Um, this is, um, look, this is, this is, a, this is a, a huge endeavor and something that uh, has been going on for in the, in the thought process and, and the conceptual stage for 30 plus years. Um, you know, our, um, the effort here is the, has been to get it off that conceptual and get it into the operational. And, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a, a, a lot to it. I don't think financially, though, um, I see any real big impediment if you look at what it's going to cost the baseline and get us going on an annual basis. It's really in the bigger scheme of things, not very much. What the biggest challenge in my view is here is overcoming institutional, uh, you know, organizational uh, challenges. You have so many different entities and players. 
and how you get all everybody on the one team, one fight effort on the same playing ground moving forward uh, is going to be really important. It can be done. It has been done in the past on different initiatives. Um, uh, and that's where I think this board and, and the, the work that all the team is doing is so important. The governance structure and the ability to to get this rolled out in a state as complicated as California. I know what once we get it here, the other states will, will emulate, but really um, getting it here um, and getting it in place sooner rather than later is really important. So I really thank you all. I thank all the, 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 the partners and uh, all of you for being here today. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Adjourn. So with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes.